Welcome back to blackdoctor.org. I am your host, Dr. Renee. And today, in case you're just jumping in, this is our Minority Health Summit. This is our second annual. And so this is our third show this evening. So we got this one and one more after this. But if you're just tuning in, we've had allergies and asthma. We've had mental health because, of course, we got to get that right. And then now, of course, we're talking about weight loss. So joining me today, we have Carolina Castillo. She is a registered dietitian. And we have Dr. Yolanda. And Dr. Yolanda, what kind, what kind of, are you um, bariatric? So I actually, okay. yeah, I'm double board certified in pediatrics and bariatrics. And That's bariatrics I, I is the um, medical management yes. of weight loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, so in case you didn't hear, medical management of weight loss is what bariatric is. So she's the one we would go to if we're trying to lose weight. So let's get started. <clears throat> it seems like most people have attempted some version of weight loss in their lifetime. Weight loss seems to be a good thing health-wise. But why then does the term weight loss seem like a dirty word? You, whoever wants to take it. So I, you know, I'll start. Um, I'm not sure. Um, well, when you say what, dirty word, I'm not sure, you know, it, it's relative, right? Um, I think that it's just become such an obsession. Um, and what I hope, what I wish, what I pray <laughs> that we become obsessed more with is um how to actually achieve ideal weight, understand what ideal weight is. As a pediatrician, often we start um, at, at a very young age just trying to identify when your child, your baby is like right on the um, growth curve. And so we try to show, hey, this is what it looks like. This is when, when you're in the middle. This is when you're at 5%, 95%. And anywhere between 75 and 15, you're actually normal. You're, you're okay. What happens, however, <laughs> is that um, going, gone unchecked and not having, you know, um, not just information, but resources. If you're in areas that are food deserts and, you know, places like that, and you don't have great food choices, um, then we get out of whack metabolically, right? And so then these kids gain weight. And statistically, if you're overweight or obese by age eight, it's very likely that you will stay overweight or obese into your adolescence and then as an adult. So weight loss now is the thing we're you know all tackling. And I think it's mostly because we don't deal with the preventive, the preventative care and what weight management looks like because we don't do that enough as physicians, as nurses, as, you know, just in general, then we end up really letting people down. And then we have to now attack the issue from the space where you're already at a deficit, where really you're, you're over and we have to now help you lose weight. And I just really feel like um, the medical field, I think we let people down. We don't really help them um, stay on track. Um, we don't have, and, and uh, the truth is we don't have enough information. I'm glad you have a, 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 register, a registered dietitian here because the problem is it's not a great big part of our um, training. No. It's not a part of our curriculum. So we're letting, not only are we letting our patients down, we're letting ourselves down. You look at many of the medical population, we're actually overweight and out of shape too because we're stressed out, we're eating wrong. So I, it's just, you know, that's just my opinion, but I really feel like, if we were to do more, um, put more emphasis on preventive care, and that's in everything, everything, specifically, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, then we wouldn't have to only talk about weight loss, and then it wouldn't feel shameful, and it wouldn't feel like a dirty, you know, this dirty <laughs> word uh, secret. People don't even like the word obese. They feel like that is, um, you know, we've had to have conversations about not using that word, using over, you know, and it's like, okay, it's asthma. At the word is just asthma. Asthma doesn't mean anything. Obese doesn't mean anything. But it, you know, because there's these connotations, we've had to really deal with how we even approach the subject. And then you have a lot of physicians that don't approach the subject because they're actually overweight or obese. And, and they so, don't want the patient to come back and really, say, well, they but don't. You, You're right. Right. And I know you've spoken before about with children, it's really difficult because. 
you don't want to get them on a pattern and where they're, you know, cycling and they're dieting and not that, but you want to figure out, nip it in the bud because you don't want them to be obese adults. And, and Carolina can talk about this more, but the fact is, so what I think the dirty word really is, is diet. Yeah, I don't I think the dirty. Answer. Yeah, I don't think the I dirty agree. word is actually weight loss. I think the dirty word is diet, and that's actually where the issue is. If we if we start talking about meal planning and um, you know your lifestyle, when we when we sort of say it that way, but the word diet doesn't mean the restricted meal plan to lose weight. It just exactly. like you can have a vegetarian diet, you can have a vegan diet, you can have a Mediterranean diet. It just means what do you generally eat for nutrition? That's what it's supposed to mean. <laughs> However, we've changed it into these very fad, um, you know, models of rapid, unself, un, uh, unsafe, unhealthy weight loss. You know, lemonade diets, and you know the the or what is it? The lemonade cayenne pepper, yep. you know, diets, and all of these Not things. But like now, when people hear the word diet, um, they're very um, they're they're it it becomes this this struggle between whoever's trying to give them a meal plan and and a a better way of eating or something that might be long that that might be a little bit it might deal with longevity because if you can't sustain what you're doing it won't help you it period so i think the biggest i think the real problem is the dirty word that i find in my um in my experience is is diet i agree and um carolina i'm sure you encounter this all the time because when someone comes to you clearly you know, they're coming to you because they either need to lose weight or maybe they're a diabetic and they need to figure out a new way of eating. Yes, of course. So we usually, you know, when I see the patients at the clinic, I agree with you, Dr. Yolanda, diet has a connotation of e being equal to restriction and not uh, in severe restriction, right? And I usually tell patients, you know, try to focus on a balance. And I think, number one, we don't get enough education on what the different types of category of food are, carbohydrates, and then you divide them into simple complex. You have your, you know, um, protein, you have your fats and all of that. And then fats also get, you know, it, it's a little bit complicated when you start kind of, you know, explaining those to patients. People just kind of know a little bit of, you know, protein, carbs, and all of that. But we do want to focus on like, you know, changing a little bit of the how we address and how we talk to patients, you know, instead of I, I don't like to use the word diet either. I say your meal plan, your eating for the day, what are your current habits for eating, you know, so it's trying to explain to patients, you know, that one weight loss doesn't happen fast real healthy weight loss, meaning body fat, not water and muscle, right? Because those are two different things. The, also, you know, we also tell patients there's a difference, you know, on the scale, right? Just because the scale is going down, it Ooh. does not mean that the weight loss is adequate, right? Um, so we try to kind of, you know, explain to patients, you know, number one, healthy weight loss. And I always tell patients, it's better for you to lose the weight steady and slowly, kind of like the turtle, versus kind of like trying to- Home and steady wins the race. Home and steady, yes, yeah, exactly, wins the race. So, you know, it, and it's hard sometimes for patients, you know, to analyze that because they just want results fast. Yep. And a good way to look at it, I tell patients, is regardless of the age that you are, in your 20s, in your 30s, and your 40s, or, you know, when after, you- <laughs> Or after. <laughs> after you build these habits for the amount of years that you've been on this earth right and it's not going to change in a week or in a month your body has you know you've built these habits when you're hungry when you're not hungry when you kind of feel a little bit you know um that you want to indulge in something so it's changing that mentality first before before addressing the habits that I think it's the most important thing. And also, like Dr. Yolanda said, ex you know, doing a better job of explaining what the categories of different food is. I don't believe there's, you know, I tell patients there's no, it's not, there's not such a thing as a bad food or a good food is the, it, the, the yeah, finding a balance where... And, 
No, and I'm saying what's really important about what you're saying, I, I'm getting old, so I forget things. So if I don't, you know, so pardon me if I, <laughs> if I, if I jump in. But what I want to make sure I focus on is something you said, and that was that you um, you talk about changing your mind before you change the habits. That is literally the key. What people don't realize is healthy eating, weight management, and even weight loss starts in the brain. Mm -hmm. Before it happens anywhere else, it starts here. It's making the decision. It's finding the right tools. It's finding something that's sustainable for you. So you got to put the, the mental work in first. Get the I can do this attitude on you, right? It's just, just a whole thing. And then you begin the process, right? And so many people um, are still shopping around for what, what they think, you know, oh, I'm going to do a, a pillow. They say pa a, a paleo. Pa I'm, I'm sorry. I do the Peloton every day. I'm saying pillow. The um, paleo diet, right? Oh, they say that's good. Then they're like, oh, wait, what's this clean eating thing? Oh, hold on. What's the, you know, and so they're, they're halfway intermittent fasting. They're halfway, you know, clean eating. They're half, and they really don't know the concepts around each of those things, nor do they know the tools they need to make those things successful. Truthfully, almost any of those things could be successful if you did them correctly and you were all in, you understood what you were doing, you were like ready for it mentally, and then you prepared for it in your physical. I say you got to be mentally ready, but you have to prepare for it in your physical, meaning all the processed foods that you've been dealing with, throw them out. They shouldn't even be there as a backup. It should be gone, right? Um, having nights, uh, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables or have your, your, your schedule set up so that every... Tuesday or every, you know, because this is a weekly thing. If you're eating particular ways, there's, there's you got to be shopping once a week or you got to know that you're going to do frozen, you know, but you just have to be ready no matter what it is. I do a lot of meal planning, meal planning, meal planning, and a lot of meal prepping because I come in hungry, last minute, got to eat something just like anyone else. I'm human. So I've already have, you know, roasted, I, I roast two to three heads of cauliflower at a time when I do it, right? Because that's my prepping. So that when I, because I eat that stuff like it's popcorn, I love roasted cauliflower. But when I need to grab something, it's going to be healthy because I have a bunch of healthy choices. Not because I'm, you know, I'm just so magnificent at it. I've just put the work in ahead of time. And so that's the thing that we have to really talk to our patients about. One of the things I want to say, for instance, the habit, this is water, right? I drink about three of these a day. This is, there we go, right? If you go ahead, because right. there we go, right? So when you're <laughs> drinking, when I feel anything a little tired, a little, you know, a little, I, I'm drinking water. Most people don't know. There's studies that have shown us that nine out of 10 times you are thirsty, not necessarily hungry. There are studies that have shown that people who drink a, drink more water or it's specifically water, we're not tea, we are not coffee, we are not made, we are 70 to 60, 60 to 70% water. Please replace water. I get so sick of people say, well, I drink a lot. What are you drinking? You have to drink water as I'm talking to you, as I'm wi eyes wide open, um, when I perspire, it's water that I'm losing. So I don't need to replenish with anything but water. But the point I'm making is that's one of the greatest habits you could actually adopt mm -hmm. is drinking water all day long because you don't feel as hungry. It cuts down on your um, hunger. It actually helps flush fat cells. It actually um, mobilizes fat cells. Sometimes people who are having plateaus and things, they, you know, they're working out, they're doing us, they're not drinking enough water. And I can't, it's so hard for me. I can't, I can't emphasize enough how important water is. Absolutely important. Yes. So, I am someone who, and if you, because I don't have the pictures ready to jump up, but if you go to my Instagram, you can see, I used to be almost two of me. <clears throat> so I'm only four foot 11, which you can't tell that on the screen, but I'm only four foot 11, but I was tipping the scale somewhere around 240 or something at one point, And I wore a size 22, 24 dress. 
So um, in the pandemic, I was doing a whole lot of videos with Black Doctor and I was like, oh my God, I am going to have three chins in a minute and it's looking really bad on camera. And so <laughs> out of my vanity, I was like, we've got to get this under control. Everybody and needs to know what their motivation is, right? I tell people that is my motivation. It's, it's the bad. I'm sorry. It's I'm with you. I'm with you, Dr. Renee. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. I, I This is not looking good. <laughs> I was going to be turning 44, I think. And I was like, I, I got to do something. So I got a trainer because if I'm paying somebody, I'm going to be a little bit more cognizant of actually doing it. So he said he usually works out with you twice a week. I was like, no, nah, we going to do three days a week. Yeah. <laughs> that was my thing. I said, we going to do three days a week. I didn't change anything I ate. I just said three days a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I said, okay, I did, I did in January, 2017, I think it was, I started intermittent fasting or 2018. And I was like, oh, I can do that. That works for me. So I was like, let me get back to my, my intermittent fasting, act like I have some sense, eat when I'm supposed to eat and not when I'm not supposed to eat. So that helped. And I was low self-control. Absolutely. Exactly. I was losing. It was great. So then, um, my sister, we watched this um, webinar kind of thing on YouTube with Oprah with Weight Watchers. And she said, we should join. And I was like, no, she said she was joining. And I'm very competitive. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. She's going to join. Well, You're gonna not going to lose more weight then. <laughs> and guess who won? But uh, so, so I was like, I'll you know, I'll join. So my sister, she um, she moved in and brought her Peloton. I don't do spin bikes. Because my flat feet didn't yeah. like them. And oh, I said, really? You know what? I'm going to, I said, what would I do? What do I need to do if I'm going to get on the stupid bike? That's exactly what I said. She's like, well, you need shoes. We don't wear the same shoe size. So I go to Peloton's website. She goes, no, 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 no. Go get them somewhere else because those are expensive. So I said, oh my God, let me see if Amazon has them because this surely isn't going to work and I'm going to return them because Amazon Prime. I could just put them back in the bag and take them back. Mm. So I buy these cheap shoes off of Amazon. I get on the bike. My butt was the only thing that hurt. My feet didn't. I ordered a new seat that night. It came the next day. I now have almost 600 rides on the Peloton. I started January yeah. 2021. Really now we have a tread amazing. also. That's amazing. We have amazing. a tread also. And she had been telling me before she came here with the bike, Renee, they have an app. You can do the stuff on the TV. You can do it on your phone. You can just be on my account. If, if I'm not home, I'm on my Peloton app anywhere I go. I was in Paris for a week. I was on my Peloton app. I was in sure. Hello, Mexico in October. I was on my Peloton app. On your Peloton it's app. I People go. don't know. There's all kinds of ways to and get And so this now thing. I am, and mind you, I am a severe asthmatic who couldn't barely run a mile, let alone exercise. I run outside with the Peloton app all the time now. I ran last week when it was hot in Michigan. Um, this past weekend, I ran. I did a 45-minute walk run, speeding past people. Couldn't believe myself. And I work out every day, which is insane too. because too. I hate working out. But I tell everyone I love the results because yeah. I wore, wore a size but eight that's because for the first it's here. time as an adult that I've ever worn a single digit size. Yes. I was like, I don't believe this. I put on some jeans that were size 10. I yes. haven't done that since I was like in middle school. Yes. So that's why I work out. And I also know that it'll help. It's my health is so much better. I got checked for my life insurance and my blood yes. pressure was like 90 over 60. The lady yes. was like, I've never seen blood pressure this low. That's, no, Are that's you okay? Yeah, yeah. So I'm fine. I'm good. And I drink a gallon of water a day. She's right. Water is everything. My trainer tried to tell me I was a little late on the game, but then I got my little <laughs> fancy water bottle that lights Yeah, up. you know what? The tools, though, here's the deal. Really, the tools matter. Um, I didn't drink my full gallon before um I got something that worked for me. So I used to have the big one with the number. I, me too. You know, I know. That didn't work for me because carrying this big thing around and it made me feel like you it's know so like, heavy. Like, yeah honestly it was counterproductive because if I only saw myself down like four rings it, it made me feel like oh well I'm not getting it yeah like I'm not getting Forget it again. So yeah. what's funny is this is a half a gallon. I interestingly, I like things that I can't see in there. Like I'll finish it 
and I'm slipping, surfing, surfing, and it's like, like, but it's at the end and slurping, and I'm like, wait, I'm done. I, it's better for me not to actually see because I don't, out. I don't. Yes, I'm not forcing myself. Like, how much more do I have to go? So everyone just has to know what I works. Know for what them. works for you? I get on the scale every day. Every, there's people who think I'm absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm once a week. I get on every day. I don't need every day. I'm once a week. I, I don't do the scale. <laughs> she said, "The more you weigh, the less you weigh." And I said, "That's so true." Because in the pandemic. I mm -hmm. did not get on the scale. And when I tell you the scale, just, I didn't know. Yeah, well, like, yeah, there's avoidance of the scale. And then there's the recognizing, like, I'm a once a weeker just because I just maintain. I know all I want to do is maintain. Like, I'm at my ideal weight. I, you know, I know what my BMI is. I know. And so if I go somewhere like Paris for a week <laughs> and there's like food everywhere, even though I was working out, you know, there are lots of little desserts that kept saying, you know, just try me. You've never been to Paris. This is, you know, so right. I was like, okay. So I came back and I had like a five pound, you know, I was like, all right, I got five pounds I need to lose. But I knew that I was okay with that. But that's why I'm once a week. But you're right. It's just a simple matter. And that's why I say everything starts here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's knowing. Um, and, and as Carolina said, education, education often is lacking. But I try to tell people all the time, it's not because we don't want to share it with you. Many of us just don't know it. That, and, and so what I, I had say. to get There's, a second we, like board certification. Said. Yeah, I went, I was a, as a full on medical doctor, having gone through, you know, having yeah. done everything. I did not learn no, much about nutrition. We did not, we learned, that just wasn't, we that wasn't part of the curriculum. Right. We learn diseases. We learn, mm -hmm. you know, stuff we don't need to know much about rickets. And exactly. you know, <laughs> things you'll like never right. see. But um, right. no, we, we, yeah. but we didn't learn eat. about obesity. We didn't mm -hmm. learn um, excess calories. We didn't understand metabolically, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on. So by the time I learned about metabolic syndrome, I was like, wait a minute. This is all the kids that I'm seeing, you know, in, yes. in Southeast DC. Yeah. Um, and then I'll, 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 you know, just in with this, one of the reasons I got, I did bariatrics is when I started to see my, the children growing this way instead of this way, <laughs> um, we, I, I realized I needed to do something, but you know what was the problem was the parents needed mm -hmm. someone mm -hmm. to actually address because they're the ones buying the food. They're the ones encouraging um, exercise or not. And so it was, I was feeling like I was failing the family if all I could do was address the kids, but mm -hmm. I couldn't really help the parents. And so that's actually what made me um, do the second board certification because now I can do adults and children. And so I began doing more family work. Um, and that's what really sort of changed things, um, at least for me and the community that I worked in. Yes. Um, I could actually affect the whole family and not just the kids. Because before it was like, your, your doctor said you can't have this. Your doctor said you can't. And I was like, mm, that's not what I said. I, I want every, you know, so it be, that that was, for me was the, the, a world of difference. And that's so the I thing. A lot a of question. times we don't, adults don't know they don't know that they're doing the wrong thing. They just know this is what grandma fed me and this is what great grandma fed her. And so Carolina, can you tell us? Because I know the plate and I wish I had a picture, but can you explain? Because there's many people that are watching that are like, huh, what? No idea. Portions. What do you mind me to explain exactly? The well, plate, the, the well, ideal yeah. plate. So here's a good tip for everybody that's listening with us right now. You know, one of the things that I always tell patients is you got to, you know, just keep a watch on the carbohydrates. Why? It's not that they're bad, right? Pasta is not bad. And, you know, the, the problem is that those are the ones that we tend to overeat. Rice, pasta, tortillas, right? So when we go out to a restaurant, I, you know, nobody overeats cauliflower, maybe you, Dr. Yolanda, but you know, um, <laughs> you know, I, I've never heard a patient, uh, you know, a friend, oh, I I'm too stuffed of broccoli, you know, I just can't have any, right? And also, it's rare that you overeat protein, because if you have a, like, say, if you order steak at a restaurant, nobody orders another steak, right? It sits differently in the stomach, because it makes you feel full longer, because of the protein, you know, that it has. 
in that it provides you, unlike carbohydrates, you, let's say you go to a Chinese restaurant, for example, you can literally have five plates, four or five rounds of more noodles and more rice or Panda Express, right? More noodles and more rice. It sits differently in the stomach. So the tip that I was going to tell you know people here listening with us is always when you go out or when you have a plate, choose your protein first. What's going to be my protein on the plate? I always tell patients, protein, 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 always in your in meals and snacks. Choose your veggie, whatever veggie you like, right? If you always, if you keep just one because that's the only one you like, keep it, you know? I don't mind if it's just one veggie or you like cold color vegetables. But the tip is whatever carbohydrate you choose, if you're eating outside, cut that in half. Because again, that kind of limits the amount and it reduces the amount of carbohydrates that you're going to have. So it's a good weight loss tip in the sense that you have your protein, you have your vegetables. I always tell patients, eat, try to eat those first. And then lastly, kind of have your, you know, your indulgence in the mashed potatoes that you order or in the french fries that you ordered, or in the pasta that you ordered. So that way you reduce the amount of carbohydrate and most probably by the time that you're eating the carbohydrate, you might not be eating the whole amount. So that is a good way to kind of, you know, get rid of a few extra calories, yeah. you know, that way. And then also a lot of us grew up with the clean plate cup. Please throw that out. You know, that play club will get you in trouble because guess what? That's why a lot of people don't know when they're actually hungry or full. They it's have no funny, idea. Yes. It's a funny thing because I always tell, you know, the patients, oh, well, my parents told me to clean the plate. You know, it's funny because that's the only rule that everybody seems to follow from their parents. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> it's nothing else, right? Nothing else. That's the it's truth. So funny because that's, that's the, the only, you know. So I always tell patients, you have to invest in your health today, mm -hmm. so that you are healthier in your later years. Yeah. And good eating and healthy eating is not about living to you know to be 110 years old, but it's about being in this world as many years as you're going to be, but being as healthy as possible and out of the hospital right. and having a good quality of life in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 80s, and even 90s if possible. So I always tell patients. And it's possible. It, it is, is possible. possible. Exactly. And when you look at different cultures, that's the thing that I try to connect people to. There are cultures mm -hmm. who have a specific and diet, again, isn't a horrible word, right? They have a particular way that they eat, right? They have particular foods that are staples. Um, and sometimes we compare um, generations with now, and I try to tell people, but they didn't have as many preservatives in the foods that we have now. You can't- They were working a whole lot compare, harder than we were. Well, and you can't, well, first you can't compare the food, right? You can't compare tortillas that we eat today that are in grocery stores with the way most people you see, they made their own. They made their own tortillas. They made their own pasta. They made their own mm. bread. So there were all these preservatives and all these additives and all of these things that actually contribute to weight gain. But the second part is what you said, Dr. Renee, is they also work a lot differently than we work now. You also compare uh, plates. Like, I, you know, I've, I've taught so many different courses on different things. Even plate sizes, the, the, the average plate size in a family home. And, and my mother had a china cabinet after she passed. You know, we went through these these um this really pretty dishes that we had growing up. And I was looking at the dishes and I was like, the plates almost look like um um doll, you know, like it was something from a doll collection. <laughs> like they were so like the plates look like some modern day saucers. I, honestly, like they have these saucers that are kind of like on the big side that are for like plating, but our plates were about that size. So the plate sizes have gone from eight inches 20 years ago. They're now 12 inches. So they went eight, then they went 10, then they went 12. You go to certain restaurants like Cheesecake Factory, and you already know, they're platters. The yeah. plates are platters, right? And it's that kind of thinking, you know, that it's, you know, a bang for your buck, right? To trying to get the most food with the That's least amount of money. And I know that there's, you know, that those situations. But like I said, you have to invest in your, you know, in your health and in your food now. Money you so spending, that you're going to spend a whole lot more. In the hospital, or on change or on wardrobe changes, right? Like all of the things that you're spending money on, mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I, I haven't had, I, I buy clothes because I want to buy clothes, not because I've had to buy clothes that are bigger. And I, it amazingly, I mean, again, I'm over 50. I'm, I'll be 53 this year. And I have clothes that I can still wear. I don't, and I keep saying, I got to purge. I got to purge. Mostly it's because I can wear most of the stuff that I could wear 20 years ago. Um, and so I try to tell people the thing that you're going to spend money on, right? Not mm -hmm. the food. For, you're, you're not saving money by buying a bunch of food right now. You're actually going to end up spending money on. And it's, it's, we spend billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Obesity costs billions of dollars. And it's not the the just the health part of it. It's medications. It's hospitals. It's, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, workman's comp it's not being able to go to work there's all kinds of reasons that we are spending that much money um and we just don't have to but you know we just have to get control so uh caroline i think this is a good question for you mm -hmm. should the typical 1200 calorie deficit meal plan be applied to all who are attempting to lose weight or should this vary the short answer is no the so. reason being is that it depends on your height it depends. So I'll, I'll say this. It depends on your height. It depends on your current weight. And it depends on your sex, female, male, right? Um, and it also depends on the amount of exercise that you're doing. So let's say I'm 5'2 and another, you know, girl is, on, you know, 5'2, but I work eight hours sitting down and she works, you know, eight hours moving boxes around and, you know, exercises an hour daily. Even though we're the same height, you know, because our energy is different, you know, consumption, then she, we're going to need different calories. A good way, you know, for that, you do have, there are some measurements or some, I should say, um, <clears throat> ways that you can figure out how, what the amount of calories you should have. But the best way to do it is called, um, it's doing an in-body uh, assessment or there are some scales on amazon that you can buy and the way that calories are based are off of your how much muscle you have so depending on how much muscle you actually that's how you know you have that's the amount of calories that you should be you know eating because you know um it depends yeah on the muscle and it's not because again it, it also depends on the height and weight and so, I mean, the short answer is you should probably see someone <laughs> to yeah, make sure. You should, that to get you, an actual. Yeah, I mean, just to be safe on the safe side, there are some formulas out there. And I don't think that either one of us would like propose to say it to someone. Yeah, use yeah. this formula, that formula. Because the other thing is we don't know what other conditions you have, right. what exactly. other, you know, restrictions. Um, you know, let me say that out loud, too. I say drink a gallon of water, but if you have fluid restrictions, don't yeah, drink, drink a gallon, gallon of water, right? So, you know, anybody <laughs> with kidney failure or something like that knows that they're fluid restricted and they're not supposed to drink. So there's always caveats, and which is why having, um, uh, you know, being connected to a, a healthcare specialist or a, a um, diet dietitian is always a good idea. But what I was going to say about the muscle things, this is actually a good time to talk about um, something that was in the chat, and that's BMI. That's right? where I was going. So, yep. so BMI, um, when, when you talk about how much muscle you have, you know, we've had conversations about this, and there are studies out there that talk about the fact that what the BMI is, so what it stands for is body mass index, right? And it looks at, for someone's height, how much weight should their frame carry but um it's and so it's pretty it, it, it's not a bad tool to use but it it can be skewed um one of the um things to know about it is historically the bmi chart the numbers themselves were based on men um that were scandinavian <laughs> you know so it was you know european like everything else right it was based on european white and white men and so it was looking at the, uh, again, their frame and how much weight was on their frame, but they're not very muscular people in terms mm -hmm. of just historically, that's just not how they're built. So a lot of times as a, as a, a black female or a physician who is, is um, serving a population 
that has, you know, the kids, you know, the black girls and boys are actually pretty muscular. The BMI scale makes it look as though all most almost everyone is overweight or obese. Right. And I can look at them and look at them like you're you're like all muscle. You're not overweight. Mm-hmm. You're not obese. This BMI scale is skewed because of the origins that it has and what it was based off. So we do look at body fat. So I'm glad that, you know, Carolina brought that up. We're actually, we're actually the more accurate way is to look at body fat. Um, and there are ways to, to measure body fat. And there's some scales, but we also use certain tools that would look at body fat in certain places on your arm, you know, look at. And then the other thing is the circumference, right? Differences, um, you know, with your body in terms of hip and, and waist. And so there's all kinds of other ways. The other thing that about the scale, the reason the scale is something you have to know what, what you're looking for is if you build muscle, so if you're losing weight, but working out and building muscle, you could get frustrated because mm-hmm. the skill looks like it's not moving. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I'm doing all of this restriction. I'm drinking all this water. Dr. Yolanda said a gallon of water. I'm drinking water. I'm working out every day. Dr. Renee said work out. She said, get the Peloton. I'm doing all of these things. Mm-hmm. And my scale isn't moving. But guess what? Your clothes fit better. Exactly. Right. You, measure you, know that you're, you're, you know mm-hmm. that your clothes are fitting better. You know that you have more energy. You know. So what's happening? You're losing fat, but you're energy. gaining muscle. And mm-hmm. muscle weighs more oh. than fat. So a lot of times you just have to know what to look for. If you're only looking at the scale, then you could miss right. that your blood pressure is down. I was just going to say, go to yeah, the doctor because your numbers could be different. You yes, could have your blood pressure down, blood pressure your, down, your hemoglobin A1C may be down, your cholesterol. There's all these other things that are happening. So if you're married to the changes on the scale, you could miss all the other things that the blessings that, you know, the positive things that are going on around you. And so that's why it's really important to understand what Carolyn is saying about you know, fat um, and, and, you know, what to eat, what not to eat and just understanding. And the thing, there's one thing I like to tell people, and it's a little scientific, but somehow it helps. I always say the thing about sugar, right? So all sugar isn't bad. It isn't. But carbohydrates, there is complex and they're simple. It sounds backwards, the complex are the good, <laughs> the simple are the bad, right? You would think, oh, it's simple, that's the ones I want. No, those are the ones you don't want. Too simple, so simple that when your body breaks it down, it stores it as fat immediately. The complex are what you want because your body has to actually work harder to um, digest and you actually burn calories by eating those carbohydrates, right? Yes. But the point I make is anytime you eat sugar, and your insulin level spikes, your body has to, I'm sorry, and your sugar level spikes, your body has only one thing it can do to process that sugar and it has to release insulin. Mm -hmm. In the way, in the um, presence of insulin, we build fatty acids, which is fat, fat cells. So when you have something, that's why two things, the five, two and five, two person, right? They're not equal because one's working out with, if you have two things that are food that's 350 calories, they're not equal if you have a 350 calorie Krispy Kreme donut, but a 350 calorie chicken breast, right? People are like, oh, but it's only 350 calories. They're not the same. That 350 calorie Krispy Kreme donut, which is all simple sugar, spikes your blood sugar up really, really high. And the more blood sugar, the more uh, the higher the blood sugar goes, the more insulin you have to release in your body. The more insulin you release, the more fat the more cells you make. Mm-hmm. When you eat a 350 calorie piece of chicken, somebody <laughs> said, but it's delicious. I know, <laughs> but for two seconds though. But when you eat that 350 calorie um, chicken breast, it, your your blood sugar may only go up a sl- this much, whatever the amount is, but it's a very big difference. That's how much insulin you'll need, right? Because it's very little car uh, sugar and protein. And then you're not going to lay down as many fatty acids. So you just have to understand that the numbers, you you just have to get, an, get that information. Calories are a good thing to understand, but they're not the only things that count. And there's they're so not many equal. 
Not exactly. <laughs> That's a good one. They're not all created equal. Yeah, maybe, no, they're not. Carolina, maybe you know something about this. It seems the 1200 calorie diet is typically prescribed by MDs at the weight loss clinic. So I, that's why I was inquiring into a more diverse opinion. Yes, unfortunately, I go, I don't want to say doctors are wrong. You know, they're trying to do You can say thing. it, you can say it. You know, they're very helpful, you know, but unfortunately, I do stick to what I was saying that you have to make sure that you know your body first. What is your body fat, you know, percentage and what is your muscle mass? So the way to, you know, one of the ways to know this, like I said, you can buy like a scale, you know, um, on Amazon, or usually a lot of the gym memberships, yes, you know, right. they also have them available. Sometimes, you know, I, I sometimes tell patients that they can go and kind of look at the, the free trial and, they, and get a free trial and then ask them if they have it because most of the gyms have it and they can do it for free. You know, it doesn't, you know, for them, it doesn't cost anything. And depending on the amount of muscle that you have, it'll give you like a specific number of calories. So let's just say the way that I like to go about it is let's just say that you do the in body and you do the assessment and it tells you that based on the muscle mass that you have, that you're burning 1500 calories a day. So the fifth, the way that it goes is if you, if you're burning 1500 calories, right. And if you eat that amount, so it's gonna kind of, you're going to stay at the same weight. Now, what people tend to kind of, I think, you know, do it wrong or not the best way is that they severely under eat. So if you're burning 1500 calories, I usually like to take away two to 300 calories only just because it's a slower and a more steady weight, weight loss, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it really comes down to what your body composition is, not just you know, this is the 1200 yeah. calorie and everybody should be on it. You know, it, they can't prescribe a 1200 calorie, you know, to a six foot male and me five to female. I mean, right. it's just calorie muscle wise, we're going to be completely, you know, different. So it would work, you know, or if you have, you know, if you can go to your primary and say, hey, I would like to get this, you know, assessment and see what my body fat percentage is and what my muscle mass is. And you can, you know, start that conversation at least with your primary so that he doesn't, he or she doesn't prescribe, you know, the 1200, um, you know, calorie diet for you. Well, my face is contorted because there are a lot of primary care doctors who don't do that, who aren't, um, they're just, they're, they're not trained or equipped. Um, and so it, it is unfortunate because again, it's just not a part of what most of us are trained to do. Um, and that's why I think people do, um, you know, look at something and say, oh, they say 1200. OK, I'll do that. Yeah. But it's a good idea to just get connected to somebody who really does understand weight loss. Um, yes. And and all weight loss clinics aren't the same either. Right. Call me well, that was going to say um, there's a difference between weight loss clinics and Dr. Yolanda. And so I think that you probably would want to research and figure out what does your insurance cover for a bariatric physician and mm -hmm. go visit one of them. I don't know. Does Dr. Yolanda do telemedicine? Um, I do. I'm, you know, I'm not here to plug myself, but I will. And I do. And anybody who reaches out, if I don't, if I don't, if I can't, I'll help you find somewhere where you are. And what about because you? Again, yeah. What about you, yeah. Carolina? Uh, I also need to be plug in because I don't. <laughs> Okay. But I should start, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, so I there's some people here that have some questions specific that I think maybe perhaps they need to have a conversation with you yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. And I'll um, give my my um my well, I'll, I'll do it. We'll do it at the end. We have yeah, a my minutes. email is probably the um, best. Caroline, I think you could help this person. She said okay. her weakness is grits and potatoes, fried, baked, and boiled. So fried, baked, I know boiled. some ideas of what I would use, but what would you suggest that she would eat instead of eating the fried baked or boiled potatoes, white potatoes. So my first thing would be, you know, the good news, the good news and the bad news. The good news is you can still have them and enjoy them. The not so great news is you have to limit the amount. Mm -hmm. So I always tell patients it's a give and take. It's a relationship that you're going to have with the food, right? So we don't want you to go to one extreme and completely avoid it because you're good. You love it. Right. And you don't want to go to the other extreme of having it every single day because then 
can make you gain weight. So there's two things that I tell, you know, I usually suggest. One, if it's grits, right, ideally it keep it to between a half a cup, maybe three fourths of a cup. But because it's a carbohydrate, I always tell patients have a protein first before you eat the grits. So that way, the grits, like I said, you could have two or three cups of it and not still be full or feel full, mm -hmm. right? It's very easy to overeat it. So <laughs> my recommendation is you can still, she, the, you know, the person mm -hmm. can still have it, but I would keep it to a half maybe three fourths of a cup. That's rule number one. And rule number two would be to eat either an egg or two eggs prior to you having the grits. And then potatoes, what would you say about fried would, fries it, or baked it would, it would be the same recommendation. Okay. So you want to keep it uh, first. You want to, you want to have it, you want to make it complex carbohydrates, right? Uh, make it uh, boiled potatoes versus fried potatoes, right? Um, if you want to add a little bit, you know, seasoning and butter, that's fine. Just, you know, obviously don't overdo it on the butter, but it would be the same recommendation. It would be a half a cup, ideally no more than three fourths of a cup, but it's the same thing. You want to eat the protein first, because like I said, the idea here is that you satisfy that hunger that you have without overeating on the carbohydrates and the protein will help with that. Also, if you are a diabetic, it also, the protein, when you eat it first, prior to eating the carbohydrates, the protein that you're Lovely. eating, it delays the digestion and the absorption of the, you know, of the carbohydrate, therefore not spiking your blood very high and right. you know, making it a, a smaller spike. Yep. So it and requires be, less insulin then yeah. for, your, this for insulin. your body. Um, so, and I think for me, I'm big on substitutions. That's I just, what I was yeah, about to say. Yeah. I was going to say, sometimes I have conversations with people. I think sometimes the dietitians are actually really nice. You guys are. You're much nicer <laughs> than I am. Um, because I, I say to some people, there's some things you can't eat. There's some things you're going to gonna have to get used to. I mean, because how has it helped? How has it treated you so far? How, how, you know, sometimes I like, so that those boiled fried and uh what yes. is it the other way she likes it baked baked grits what have they done so far for you we we've seen what they have done so let's try something else let's either and so for me i you know i'm always like there's quinoa there's polenta there's different things that you can do or you're adding protein like you said to it right you have to but i'm often like you know i used to do i was a I used to do um, rice just from growing up, just traditionally. There were things that I ate rice with, red beans and rice. And, you know, mm -hmm. I would put whatever over rice. That, and I don't even eat rice. I may eat brown rice every once in a while. But I've become like quinoa is this thing that it's, I, I didn't grow up eating it. It wasn't right. this, you know, my, my parents didn't eat that. Um, yeah. But it's, I, I'd rather have um, quinoa. And put some, you know, some beans over it or something. And I'm perfectly okay with that now. Yeah. So I think sometimes some tech things that people just don't know, there are other other things that you, and quinoa is high in protein. It's actually this thing that I started substituting for these carbs, but found out they're high in protein. And it actually works well with a lot of the um, substitutions or a lot of the proteins that I was eating the carb with. So I think there are ways that you can um, just substitute some things and not have to um, and or or begin to decrease and then add, you know, because, again, people don't want to feel restricted. I get exactly. it. So maybe decrease and add. But then you find out you actually like these other these other, you know, yeah. ways of eating. Yeah. And once you change your palate, you don't even want those things anymore. That's yeah. So that's another change. Yeah, cleaning your palate. That's another topic that, yeah, it would yeah. be great to, you know, if we have some more time uh, to discuss. But that's the other thing I tell patients either, you know, people, when people ask me about cookies, right. And sugar-free cookies and, you know, and I usually tell them it's either you have the, let's say Oreos, we'll just put, you know, as an example, either you have two options, either you eat two Oreos, right. And you, you know, restrict them, but you only, but you have the real thing and the real cream feeling, you know, 
right? Mm -hmm. Or you have five cookies of the sugar-free, but it's one of those. Choose your battles, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you feel like you just want to have a little bit more, so then maybe you'll do the sugar-free. It doesn't mean that you can indulge and, you know, eat hot what, <laughs> whatever amount of the sugar-free. You still have to limit it, but you can definitely afford to have five cookies of the sugar-free ones versus the two Oreos. And right. it's that kind of mentality. There's never, no, I can't eat that. You know, we, we're trying, right. I like to try to get away with that. You have options. So like the Dr. Yolanda said, you have the option of doing a substitute, you know, like the cauliflower rice, or you have the option of doing the real rice. But again, you have to portion it out to a half a cup. So, or even, you know, put half and half, right? To make it a bit, you know, more bulkier and to still have that, you know, flavor and, you know, consistency of the rice because cauliflower doesn't, you know, rice doesn't have that consistency. So you can eat, you know, half of the brown rice, right, that you that you really want, right? But then maybe add the cauliflower rice to make it bulkier, but you still get the taste of it a little bit. So there's always... And, then, and that helps you wean as well. It's almost like with a baby, sure. you tell someone to wean. Like, I'll tell them, like, look, you can use, you can do three quarters of what you really want and then a quarter of the, the stuff we're substituting. Mm -hmm. Do that for a while. Then you do half and half. And then yes. you do the opposite, just a quarter of what you really like with the, you know, what, what we're trying to substitute so that you get to the point where you can actually go all the way with whatever the substitution is mm -hmm. and you get used to it because your palate gets used to it. I think it's, again, we're just creatures of habit. And if we just change those habits, we if we take time and be intentional about changing those habits, I think we're okay. Um, Murray Rose, I want to tell you, we see, I saw your, your question, but <clears throat> I don't think that the ladies can handle that here. Um, but she's five one and she weighs 115 pounds and she has fat in her stomach and it's not helping her COPD. So I think that she, she gave her email address. Um, she, she weighed 146 and she wants to lose 20 pounds, but I thought you said you weighed 115. Oh, Okay, but you need to talk to the. I think you should talk to a doctor because that might be something else going on with you. Um, yes. But I was gonna say I love potatoes too. I have not met a potato <laughs> I don't like. But kohlrabi, you cut it up. It tastes like French fries, especially if you have one of these lovely air fryers. Put it in there. It tastes like French fries. Also, if you even do um, regular potatoes and then you do you bake them instead of frying them. Yes. Um, sweet potato or fries. air fryers, sweet potato yeah, air fryers fries. Fries is great um, option. are wonderful. Um, there was another thing we used in substitute and it was, we had French fries, but it wasn't potatoes, but there's all sorts of things. If you search the web, there is so mm -hmm. many different substitutions that well, if you put the little salt on it, which I even have a fake salt because I'm not trying to have high blood pressure. You put that on it, you'd never know it wasn't, it wasn't French fries, regular old fries. Right. So, right. you know, you have, to, you have to put in a little work maybe, but mm -hmm. it'll be worth it in the long haul because I'm telling you, I didn't know how bad I felt till I felt a whole lot better. Yep. I had and no you, idea. I was like, oh my God, I, I feel so light. And I was it's like, like asthmatics. It's like an asthmatic who finally breathes. It's like, oh no, I was about know, to say, like, I'm an asthmatic. And that was the same thing. I didn't know I couldn't breathe deeply till the day I did. I was like, wow. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's 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 amazing. It's wonderful. But I mean, I commend you, Dr. Renee, for for losing that weight, but for it being the natural way. And that's the other thing people need to know. Bariatricians, it's more the medical management, meal planning, things like that. Bariatric surgery, that's different. different. So often they'll have to come to us to lose enough weight if you're even considering surgery. But then when they find out that they're losing naturally on their own with just some effort, then many times we abort having to even go to surgery because they're right. actually really doing what they need to do with the meal plan, you know, the consistency, the, the, the substitutions, all of the stuff that you're talking about. And it becomes, um, they, they get really excited because they don't have to do surgery. Um, and so many people think they have to do surgery and they find out they really don't have to. And, and not knocking surgery, but everybody doesn't need doesn't it. Doesn't need it. Right. And sure. it, it's great for those that need it. But 
you know, there are people that don't need it. And if you can figure out, you know, if you can get on and figure out, okay, this is going to work. And I mean, people be amazed how much food I eat, but I also, I work out every day. Mm -hmm. I exercise, you know, I work out every day. I drink my water. And I also, I only eat during certain hours of the day. So yes. when you do all of those things, you know, mm -hmm. you can enjoy. And, um, so I, I just really want people to understand that you need to figure out what it actually feels like to be hungry. Because a lot of us just eat for the sake of eating because it's dinner time or it's lunch time or it's breakfast time. No, make sure you know that you're actually hungry. And then stop eating when you're full. And I've told a lot of people, when you eat, don't talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. Don't be, you know, busy doing 12 other things. Sit down and actually eat because then you'll actually taste the food. It'll taste mm -hmm. a little better. And then you'll actually recognize because what happens when you do all of that is hours later, you'll forget that you ate because you didn't even realize you ate. So you want to sit down and actually enjoy your meal. And stop eating when you're full. Chew, chew 10 times. Several dietitians, nutritionists, doctors have said to me, chew your food 10 times before you swallow. That's because some people eat like they inhale the food and they don't even right. realize it. Right. And then they miss the cue. And that's what happens. A lot of people miss the cue. So it's, un, it's hard to, some people don't know how to stop when they're full, right? right? Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. One of the things I say is you don't even need to eat till you're full. That's actually means you overate. Right. You want to eat till you're satisfied, right? Because there is a difference. You and that's why portions matter, portion control versus calories. Portion control, you know that half a cup, you know this is a cup, maybe this is three ounces, four ounces. What happens with portion control is you should know what hunger feels like, right? And then you should know what it feels like to be satisfied. But there's something that people don't recognize, know, and that is by the time you actually feel full, you've actually overeaten because your brain, it takes that 15 minute, that loop, right? That feedback to say, oh, I'm done eating but you continue to actually chew food, swallow food. And by the time you get the signal, your folks are unbuttoning their pants. Right. And, you know, they're just, you know, and that's my point. So I, I try to get people to recognize what it feels like to, to just be satisfied. Cause there's a, there's, there's a, Oh, I'm not hungry anymore. And you could actually stop there. If, if you know that you've eaten the portions that you right. sort of laid out which is why what Carolina said is really important. If you go out, one of the things, one, one of my, it's not, it's a tip, but I do it all the time. So it's such a habit. If I go out to eat, the first thing I ask for is a to-go box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I put half of it, like you're saying, in the to-go box. I eat what's there because guess what's happening? No matter what you say, you try to focus on your eating, but there's so many social settings Sure. Of food, right? So if I'm sitting there and I'm eating and I'm talking, and I'm chatting. If I did not put that food away, I can easily finish it on my plate because it's just there and I'm talking and I'm eating and I'm chatting. But when I take it off the plate and I only eat what's there, sometimes I don't even get to finish that because I'm so busy eating. But it's a difference because if it, if I didn't do that, I would eat a lot more in that setting right so there's all these little mm -hmm. these little tricks but i think that you're right but learning to eat when you're sat to your i mean stop when you're satisfied um that's that's an art and that's the thing that takes practice it takes real practice because you got to get in tune with your body yeah carolina please tell people how they can find you if they have more questions so if they have more questions they can always uh email me so my email is my first name, Carolina, and then it's a dot or period. And then it's my last name, Castillo, at C as in cat, S as in Sam, H as in happy, S as in Sam, dot org. C-S-H-S dot org. Okay. I just put that in the chat for everyone. And Dr. Yolanda? Thank you. Yeah, mine's in, um, easy as well. Info, I-N-F-O at dryolanda.com. Actually, sorry, Dr. Yolanda MD. I, I always forget that. <laughs> so, info at drlandamd.com. 
So you guys, there's the information. I'm sure you got some nugget today and I'm sure you know somebody who needed a nugget from this today. So please make sure you share this broadcast so that they can watch the replay. Thank you so much, ladies. This was a great conversation. And next up, we have a discussion on multiple myeloma. If you don't know what that is, please stay tuned. Bye. Good night.